Thank you, Jesus. Good morning, everyone. Good evening. Good morning, Jesus. Good morning, Jesus. Good morning, Jesus. Father, in your name, in the name of your Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, we're rejoicing because we're coming together to celebrate another dinner with you, Father. We're coming together to you knowing not only that you have regenerated us through the power of resurrection of Jesus, but that our relationship with you is new as well. We have been reconciled with you. The old things had passed and everything that we're experiencing now is a beautiful new friendship, new relationship by which I can experience heaven in earth at this very moment. I thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross because you endure the cross with joy, having your eyes fixed, fixed on the final resolution, having your eyes fixed on the fact that enmity between God and man was going to be completely destroyed and you, by your love, we're going to reconcile us with our Creator one more time. We thank you, Father, because you have all this plan from the beginning when you saw that we needed a mediator to free us from the snare of the devil. We thank you, Jesus, for all the love that our mind cannot even entertain or grasp. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We know you're in the midst. Take control of, over our hearts, over our minds. You be the one who preaches. You be the one who makes this teaching to be easy so that everyone can understand. And you be the one who transforms every heart into a good soil so that the fruit, the, the seeds that come into that heart today produces fruits. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So yesterday we review um, two scriptures, but the impact and the depth of of the teaching yesterday was uh, super, super deep. I will say sorry for for repeating the words, but. So, Sister Marina, can we please go to a uh, second of Corinthians 5, verse 16? And if you can please um, put the Amplify to compare them. Sister Marina, can you... Can you go to second of Corinthians? So Christina, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Praise God. Okay. Yes. Just checking. Just checking if my. If you have your Bible, you can read it from it, sister, till she puts yeah. it on the screen. Okay, let me start. So I'm going to start with the Amplified first. It's a little bit longer, but it's simple, simpler to, uh, to understand. So 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16, and the AMPC says, Consequently, from now on, we estimate and regard no one from a purely human point of view in terms of natural standards of value. No, even though we once did estimate Christ from a human point of view, viewpoint, sorry, and as a man, yet now we have such knowledge of him that we know him no longer in terms of the flesh. So the KGV is saying, wherefore, which means therefore, henceforth, 
Now we know man after the flesh. Yeah, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet no henceforth know him, we him no more. So if we're saying that we know Jesus and we know that some of the apostles knew Jesus in the flesh, but now Peter is, uh, sorry, Paul is saying that he chooses not to know him in the flesh anymore. We're choosing, that's the message today. We're choosing not to know Jesus on the flesh anymore. And two things are really important for any of us who wants to have a really close relation with Christ. And those two things need to be understanding also from the point of view of the consequences that brought. The example that Brother Johnson gave us about uh, uh, consequences is like when Adam sinned, the consequences that came to mankind was uh, that um, we have sickness, sorrow, disease, death, because Adam became a rebel. So in the same way that Adam sin has con had consequences over our life, these that we are understanding today have also powerful consequences in our life. So by Jesus dying in the cross for us, there are two important consequences. The first one is that we are regenerated into a new creation. We, are made, we were made sinners, and now we are made the righteousness of God. And the second one is that the enmity between God and man how, has now been resolved, and we have been adopted into the family of God. Now we're a family member of God. Because of that re the regeneration, we know no man from our senses. And that's what the scripture is saying, that we decide to know no man from our senses anymore. We do not know any man from the world view. We know Jesus no more from our carnal thinking. And we're saying this because our carnal thinking is, is incapable of understanding the truth. And if you try to understand this spiritual truth with your carnal thinking, your carnal thinking will only stop you from receiving the revelation. It's the divine grace that we're trying to understand that cannot be grasped by our carnal mind. And that's why it's disregarded, disregarded by the world, because the world, the ones that have not been experienced to be born again, have not the capability to understand things with the spiritual mind, with the mind of Christ. And that's why they disregard the truth of the word of God. We know Jesus now, by divine grace. We disregard what we knew about Jesus in the flesh, and now we know him by divine grace. And we know uh, that we live with him and in him. If we want to have a relationship with Christ, if we want to know Christ, we can know know Christ with our carnal thinking. But now, because we are regenerated, we know him by another system. And this another system is the divine grace, is that gift that is being given to us through the Holy Spirit. And that's what the scripture is saying. We have been regenerated. So the consequences that we're talking about of Jesus dying on the cross, the first one is that we are regenerated. And now that we're regenerated, we can understand by a different system. We're applying a different system. We're no longer understanding with the carnal mind, but
but now by divine grace, I know Jesus. So the question is, once that we are sure that we're in love with our Jesus and Jesus is in our heart, where is the love for the word? So the answer yesterday that Brother Johnson explained was, the love for the word is under your feet. The consequences of Adam's sin is that he brought stream desire for the word, stream lust for the word. But instead, the consequences of Jesus dying for me is that I now experience a stream love in my heart. And that stream love in my heart places lust under my feet so that it does not longer makes me a slave, but I'm a conqueror of lust now. And that's why Brother Johnson said yesterday, if Jesus and the love for Jesus is in your heart, you automatically will place any desire or love of the world under your feet. You're a conqueror now. You're on top of it. And this change took place because of Jesus dying on the cross. This is the consequence that we need to understand that happened just because Jesus died on the cross. We who were with God, when Adam committed sin, it brought us down. We were at the level of God when he created us. But when Adam committed sin, it brought us down. And in that moment, Satan was, was made the master and we were his captives. But now, Jesus, that we no longer know in the flesh, but in the spirit, came and by his love and his dying in the cross, we have this new transformation and we're regenerated and now we understand everything that he did not in the flesh not by my carnal thinking but in my spirit in the spirit the consequences of jesus dying on the cross are that he has given us the regeneration regeneration and that is why we now enjoy the comfort of this life even though we're living in this world, we live our lives through the Holy Spirit. And that is how we can feel comfort, even going amidst problems. Even though we knew Jesus on the flesh, Paul says, we know him no more. But the question yesterday was, so did Peter know Christ in the flesh? And we say yes, because he was his disciple. Did Paul know Jesus and the flesh? And we say no, they never met in person. So the 12 apostles that were with Jesus saw him, lived with him, shared with him for years. They have seen Jesus, but Paul has never seen Jesus, at least not in the flesh. So if you have the opportunity to choose, who will you give more credibility to? Is it to Paul or to Peter? We know that Peter, James, and John live with Jesus, they were with Jesus. So if you come across a letter written by Peter, who knew, who knew Jesus in the flesh, and another letter written by Paul, who did not know Jesus, who would you value the most? Or which letter will be for you with more credibility? And we know that in, our, in the past, we will say that we will give more credibility to Peter, knowing that he knew Jesus on the physical. But Paul, in this scripture, is saying, that even though I have not seen Jesus in the flesh, 
I know him in the spirit. And he's the spirit of God who has made me known the things that are not possible to be understood by a carnal mind. But surely you can understand with the spiritual mind when you are connected through the scriptures. So even though, Paul is saying, even though I have not seen Jesus, I can say without a doubt, I have extreme, extreme spiritual presence and comfort through the Holy Spirit. So a regeneration that took place because Jesus, what Jesus did for us on the cross, connect us with Christ who is now living in our hearts. And that's why Jesus said that true worshipers will worship God in spirit and truth. Because this is not possible to be understood or lived in our carnal mind. So yesterday, Brother Johnson gave another example and said, have you ever seen pictures of Jesus, pictures of Jesus? And do you think that Jesus looks like that? We have to understand that not even the person who made the picture has ever seen Jesus in the flesh. So our faith is not in the image that we see, but is based on the word of God, which we see. And now our life, our emotions, our feelings, devotions are all based on the spirit of God who gives you the understanding by the spiritual senses, by your spiritual mind, the mind of Christ. So I, I wanted to understand and put a, an, an example here. So today I have the opportunity to try and, and minister to a gentleman and the, the wife was present and she kept on going back to tell me that he was not going to be able to move from the state that he is right now because they have tried for years doing different things and he always fails. So she, she was telling me today, he's going to fail because he has been doing it for 25 years and I'm tired of it and I, I don't want to set you on an, any expectation. So I kept on explaining her that we were going to give him a new opportunity. And as I was leaving, I grabbed her by my hand because I know she is on the word, but she doesn't have the understanding yet. And I grabbed her by, and by my hand and I said to her, it's not the physical things we're doing, it's the power of God who is going to do it. So when we're trying to understand things with our carnal thinking, we cannot grasp the regeneration, this power of being made new, this power of understanding that now my thinking, my feelings, my emotions are based on the Spirit of God who will give me new understanding. It is God that will... Sorry, it is God. It is God that is commanding that we should not know Jesus after the flesh. And that is why he's giving us the spirit who is just like Jesus. And that spirit, the Holy Spirit, is living in our heart to speak and reveal to us the truth. And when the Holy Spirit is now in my heart, because I've been regenerated by the power of Jesus and the divine grace, this will bring us from living in the sense realm to the spiritual realm. And this change of heart will help me to be connected in Christ. And that's why Paul is saying, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, meaning that he is no longer operating in the sense knowledge. 
like Adam, Adam was operating in the carnal mind after he committed sin. But a regenerated being, which we are now because what Jesus did for us, lives in his spiritual mind, by his spiritual mind, the mind of Christ. And this is the key factor of our re regeneration, that we no longer understand this seeing, living nothing by the flesh. So the question yesterday was, if I say I'm born again, but I'm still living with my carnal thinking, then what is the use of being born again? When I am born again, the Spirit of God, through the Scripture, is explaining me the spiritual life in Christ Jesus. And when that happens, automatically everything in my life begins to change. When I say I'm a new creature, it means I stop living with my carnal mind and I'm living with my spiritual mind. And that is how I am always connected to the supernatural. Another example that was given to us is that a person who is facing a trial, if he's looking to the situation with his carnal mind, he will start taking the corresponding actions and he will fail. But with the same problem, if another person experiences the same problem, but through the spirit mind, understands the situation, it will give a totally different response to the same trial, which will take him into victory. The one who is a new creation will be professing his Christian's faith every moment, even in the midst of the trial. And that's the difference. The one that is living in his carnal mind will be taken away by the darkness of the situation, by the thoughts of negativity. But the one who is a new creation will be professing his Christian faith. And this should be the most important point in our Christian faith, that I am no longer living with my carnal nature, but with my spiritual nature. I have not only a new heart, but I have a new name. I have a new life. I have a new nature, and I'm living all this by the grace of God. This change that God gave us and make to happen for us takes place in our soul. And that is why all things pass away. And Brother Johnson asked yesterday again, so how is it possible that all things can pass away? It's through the Spirit of God. It is the power of the Spirit of God. So what is happening right now, that's he, that power is even influencing my soul. So the old thoughts, the old principles, the old practices, the old way of life that I live by my senses are gone. And all these things must become new because I am now regenerated. So that's the first consequence that we were reviewing when we said there are two consequences. The first one is the regeneration. The second one is reconciliation. My regeneration for the grace of God is what, what creates a new world in my, in my soul. And therefore, all things are new. And that is why the renewed man acts with new principles, new rules, acts with new ends, has new fellowships, acts with this new love. So the second, second thing we're, we're going to talk about it is the, the second consequence of Jesus dying for us on the cross is a reconciliation. And we were going, Sister Marina, to 2 Corinthians 5, 18. 2 Corinthians 5, 18. Thank you, Sister. 
and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. We have to understand what the scripture says here. It has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So the first question that Brother Johnson asked yesterday is that, so has God given everyone a ministry? Or is it just a few? Has God given everyone a ministry? And we say, yes, the scripture is saying, and had given to us, the ministry of reconciliation. And now through Christ, all things are of God. And that's what we see in the first part of the scripture. Through Christ, all things are of God. Right now and from the beginning. When Adam committed sin, sin caused a break in our relationship with God and made us a rebel against God. But now Jesus, by dying on the cross, has destroyed the power of sin and man has been restored back to God. And that's where we're we seeing that now Jesus had reconciled us to God he says, had reconciled us to himself by Jesus. So God reconciled us to himself by Jesus. It is through the death of Christ that we have been regenerated. We have been restored. We reconcile. And our relationship with God has become once again the same. The, the sin that has broken the friendship between God and man has been nailed on the cross. God, who was justly offended by the sinner because the heart of the man was filled with enmity against God, is different now. Now, because of the reconciliation, the price has been paid. God says the price has been paid. And now God is willing to reconcile. And to get this reconciliation, he has appointed Jesus as the mediator for that reconciliation. That's what we've seen there in 2 Corinthians 5.15. God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Christ Jesus. We are to remember now that we reconcile. We are brought back to God by Jesus. God is the one who owns us from the first time ever, forever, until the end. But Satan deceived man. And because he deceived man and man accepted to be a rebel and rebelled against God, Satan became the master over the man, and Lord, the Lord God lost us. But with Jesus dying on the cross and being the mediator between God and man, by his performance, our lives are again restored. So again, we're talking about reconciliation, and this is what the, the scripture is saying. We are back we reconcile with God. All things related to reconciliation by Jesus Christ were all well planned by God. Again, this reconciliation by Jesus Christ was planned by God. And it was executed by Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And now God by the mediation of Jesus Christ, has reconciled the whole world to himself. The same God, because of the offense that has been canceled, has restored us back to the original relationship, the one that we had with him 
when Adam had not sinned in the Garden of Eve, when we were just receiving his unconditional love and we were to pour that love back into the creation and have dominion. Without any run to his justice, because God is a, is a holy God. What happened is that when Adam rebelled, that nature brought us into a new covenant. And we were under the law then and not under grace. So now having brought into, having been brought back into the grace, God himself is able to freely forgive us of all our sins and justify us by his grace. And this is happening or available to all of those who believe in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So God, by his grace, is making this forgiveness available to all of us. But it takes place to the one who believe in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And the reason why God is able to forgive us is because of the transaction has been completed, paid by Jesus. The penalty was paid by Jesus. And now the same God who has reconciled us through Jesus, the same God is speaking to us in this scripture and he's saying, just as I regenerated you and reconciled and destroyed the enmity between you and me, we, I have restored our friendship. And now I am appointing you who has been reconciled to have this minister of reconciliation. God has reconciled us to back to him through Jesus. And now he's talking to us in this scripture and he's saying, I have re regenerated you. Our friendship has been restored to what it was in the beginning. And not only that, but now I'm trusting you. I'm gifting you. I'm appointing you with this minister of reconciliation. So Brother Johnson asked yesterday, do you know what that means? It means that the very work that Jesus did to save us, and it has been completed, is given to us. God is saying he has chosen us to do the speaking and the believing, and everything will be set right for our fellow brothers and sisters. We go with our faith and we do the speaking and everything will be set right for our fellow brothers and sisters. Jesus' death on the cross is the confirmation of the whole mission accomplished. And now the same God who did all this through Jesus Christ, through his own son, God is saying he has chosen us. He's calling us. He's giving us the word of reconciliation, showing us that peace, peace was made by Jesus shedding his blood on the cross. So that blood of Jesus had canceled any of the consequences that were brought by Adam's sin. And we're reconciled to God. And that is why we're directed to this newness of life. We now have a new office. This office of reconciliation is open to all when we proclaim to anyone that God's mercy and grace is in our life and can be in their life as well. That God wants us 
to be with him, that our relationship has been restored. We are now the one, now the ones leading the unbelievers into this relationship. God is telling us Jesus came and he saved you and he took you back to me. Now I'm chosen you, I'm calling you, I'm giving you this word. So the same consolation you got, go out, proclaim it to the unbelievers, and you will be leading them back into my arms. Remember two things that Brother Johnson just to close. The two most important things by which Jesus that brought transformation into in our life is because the first one, regeneration. And then after that regeneration, which means we're made new, the old things have passed. Because of that regeneration, we have been reconciled. And because of that, of, because of that reconciliation, we are now on the same mission that the apostles were doing. We do not desire to know Christ in the flesh, but we desire to know him in the spirit because of this new nature he has put on us because we have born we have been born again by which we are now operating in the spirit and we're no longer operating in your sense knowledge we're no longer operating in the flesh the most we understand the word of god the more we're going to be able to see the changes thank you jesus thank you jesus Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.